opportunity to um, have a look at and to try and shine a light on um, what the reality um, of life on the front line has been like for um, workers who are migrants or, or people of colour um, and in particular those working in four key areas so that's health and social care, security, construction and logistics and delivery um, and as I mentioned we um, worked alongside um, three other um, partner organisations as part of this project they are the Kanlungan Filipino Consortium the three million and migrants at work and we've got representatives from all of those organizations who are on the panel today and they're going to be um, speaking to you all um, shortly. Um, just a, a, a little bit of background in relation to, to this project. Um, we um, a, as a collective group surveyed about 170 workers who worked in three key geographical areas across um, England. So that was the south of England, London and the West Midlands. Um, and as I mentioned, we focused on those four, um, four key sectors. The headlines really from, from our research and, and what we've been able to ascertain is that 76% of the frontline workers that we spoke to felt that they were putting their health at risk by continuing to work during the pandemic. And 38% were concerned that they would lose their job if they didn't go to work. So you've obviously got a, a, a conflict there um, right at the outset. Um, in addition, um, nearly a quarter of those that we spoke to had been subject to either overt racism or workplace discrimination on the basis of their nationality um, and or their immigration status. And what we also found, unsurprisingly, is that the impact on those without recourse to public funds had been more severe. So one example of this is that um, of those who were without recourse to public funds, 14% had been unable to pay their rent or mortgage on time during the pandemic despite working on the front line providing essential services and if you compare that to those who do have recourse to public funds and um, there was two percent who, who had struggled to pay their rent or mortgage and um, so clearly a, ve a very difficult time um, for, for, for lots of individuals um, this is the, the, the launch of the report that's been written um, off the back of the, the, the research that's been undertaken over the last few months. Um, the final report is going to be published on Monday and so everyone that's on this um, call um, will receive a copy um, via email. Um, but the purpose of today's event, um, and I have to say I'm absolutely delighted with the calibre of our panel and who um, you're going to be hearing from in a second, um, and obviously with an emphasis on the fact that it's International Migrants Day tomorrow, um, the purpose for today is to firstly hear from those individuals who have actually been on the front line. And as I say, we've got two um, fantastic speakers who can speak to that. Um, and then after we've heard from them, we're going to move on and a few of my colleagues from the project um, and the partner organisations I've been working with are going to share their thoughts on the research findings and then the project more generally. And so in terms of format, um, as I said, we're incredibly lucky to have a fantastic panel of speakers, but um, owing to time constraints, constraints, our first two speakers um, are going to have to leave us um, in about 20 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes. So I'm going to ask for, for, for them to speak to us first. They're going to tell us about their experiences um, as frontline workers. Um, and then I'll then open the virtual floor, so to speak, and we can have a few questions. Um, and then after which we'll proceed to, to, to hear from the remaining speakers. So if anyone does have a question as our, as our speakers are talking, please just post it into the chat and we'll be able to deal with that at the, at the relevant point. Um, I hope that everyone, um, all speakers, will have finished speaking by around quarter past four. Um, and, and then we should be able to, to, to have more questions and at the end if there are some. And so, without further ado, I'd like to start um, and introduce our first speaker. Um, this is um, Nadia Whittam MP, who is a Labour Party politician who's been the MP for Nottingham East since the 2019 general election. And if my research is correct, she's Britain's youngest MP at just 23. Um, I'll, I'll put my hands up and say, 
huge girl crush over here. I think, um, I think that is absolutely incredible. Prior to um, being elected, she worked as a hate crime worker in Nottingham. Um, and prior to that, she worked as a care worker while she was studying law at university. Um, in my opinion, um, she is a breath of fresh air in politics and made headlines this year for her workers' wage pledge, um, where she um, voluntarily um, suggested that she would take home just £35,000 of her £81,000 MP salary, and she's been donating the, the rest of that to, to charity. Um, and she also made headlines for returning to work at the retirement village um, she was working at previously. Um, and she went back there during the height of the pandemic, working in personal care, um, where she was making people food, feeding them and administering medication, etc. Um, so I won't speak too much about that because um, I'm sure that's what she's going to talk to you about now. But um, if we could start just by um, welcoming Nadia um, and, and hearing what she has to say. Thank you so much, Danielle. That was such a kind introduction. And I'm a huge fan of yours as well. So the feeling is very much mutual. And it's a real honour to be speaking on this panel alongside so many brilliant activists, um, particularly Osman, who we're going to hear from next, and his experience as a security guard during COVID. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that I'm obviously not a frontline worker anymore. I'm a member of parliament. I'm in an extremely privileged position. Um, but I was a frontline worker before I was elected. And I did return to the front line during the heat of the pandemic, though my experience on the front line is going to be very, very different to other people's because of the immensely privileged position that I'm in as someone who doesn't rely on that wage and on those um, relatively poor working conditions to pay my bills, feed a family, etc. So I'm going to speak more generally as well as about my own experience. We know that around one in five workers in health and social care was born outside the UK. And I know from my own experience that I worked alongside very talented and dedicated care workers from Zambia, Italy, Spain, all of whom worked very long, difficult hours helping elderly and disabled people, facilitating them to live their, their best and their fullest lives. And although we've heard that this is a job that the government now classes as low skilled, simply because care workers are only getting the minimum wage or sometimes even less than the minimum wage per hour, we all know that it's anything but low skilled. And when I returned to my old job, for example, back in the spring, I had to retrain to do that job. And every, you know, Prissy Patel would have to train to do that job. And, you know, she'd also have to care, which is something that you can't necessarily train for. Um, as you might have heard, I lost my job after speaking out about PPE shortages. And yes, I'm not going to pretend that that wasn't a very emotionally difficult experience for me. But as I've already said, I was in the very privileged position of not needing that job. I was donating my wages to the local mutual aid fund anyway. Not that there was that much to donate because the wages were, were pretty low, but any other care worker doesn't have that luxury. And the story here is not me losing my second job. It's the fact that this happens to workers and workers who are disproportionately migrants, people of color, women, all the time. So I, I want to talk particularly about migrant workers with no recourse to public funds, because they're people who cannot afford to risk losing their only source of income. And that doesn't just affect whistleblowers, that affects all workers who are scared to join a union, scared to complain about working conditions, scared to come into conflict with their boss because they know that they can't afford to be sacked. And that's one of the reasons why I'm supporting the JCWY's Work it Out campaign, which would, well, it's calling to scrap no recourse to public funds and also the illegal working offence. And that's not just important for workers who are migrants to defend themselves from exploitation and unsafe working conditions, but it in turn prevents 
bosses from undercutting standards for everyone. So I've recently tabled an early day motion about that, which 22 MPs have already signed. Have a look at it. If your MP isn't on that list, then please do get in touch with them, ask them to add their name. The other thing to talk about is zero hours contracts more widely. We've heard, and many people on this call will know from their own experience or the experience of their families, that many people on zero hours contracts are reluctant to self-isolate when they have symptoms because they won't get any sick pay, apart from statutory sick pay, um, and may even have their shifts terminated altogether. And that applies even more to migrants because they know that they can't count on the government to support them. And that's where precarity, the gig economy, and the hostile environment all come together to create not just a serious risk to individual workers, but a serious public health risk. And that's where the Doreen, Doreen Lawrence review of the disproportionate impact of COVID on BAME communities um, is, is going to be really important. And that's why it recommended suspending no recourse to public funds. But obviously, the government hasn't taken that on board. Um, just to say a little bit about the government's general attitude towards migrants, the government hasn't just treated migrants and particularly migrants who are people of colour as second class citizens, but as people often barely with any rights at all. And we've seen how it would rather sabotage its own efforts to control the virus than be seen to protect migrants. We've seen that in the decision to continue deportations. Um, we know that at least one of the people deported to Jamaica earlier in the month, let's not forget just two hours after it was physically possible for them to restart deportations, tested positive for COVID. We've seen it in the treatment of detainees, um, in the failure to suspend restrictions on access to the NHS for migrants, failure to stop NHS data sharing with the Home Office, and all of these things in all likelihood have caused people to die. Um, and all at the same time, we've seen this pandemic highlight and exacerbate the inexisting equalities that inequalities that already existed in society. Um, the, we've seen the rich being able to comfortably self-isolate at home. We've seen people like Jeff Bezos cashing in in the billions on the back of exploited workers, often people of colour, often migrant workers. So just to wrap up, when we're talking about the lessons that we can learn from this pandemic, that should apply long after the pandemic is history. We want to move on to a society where our key workers are treated with dignity, with respect, are not underpaid and undervalued, are not deprived of rights and removed from the country just because they're not earning enough. We want a society where no one is scared to go to the doctor or to call in sick. And where all of these structural inequalities that have led to extremely high death rates among BAME communities are taken seriously and addressed. And where Black Lives Matter is more than just a slogan to politicians. And in order to achieve that, we've got to support campaigns like the ones that I've already mentioned, the Work It Out campaign, but also, for example, the IWGB's Clapton Scrapped campaign, led by um, gig economy workers against unfair dismissals, many of them BAME and migrants. And it's really important that we platform key workers, um, and particularly not people like me, who already have privileged platforms, um, but people like Osman and many, many others, and that we continue listening to and amplifying those voices of the people who have risked their lives and shouldn't have had to risk their lives to save ours. So just lastly, thank you so much for this valuable report and you can count on me to continue to raise these issues in Parliament. Solidarity everyone. Thank you so much Nadia, that was um, perfect, perfect start and sort of an introduction to the, the, the themes and topics that I think we're going to be um, talking about into the afternoon. Um, 
I'll move on to, to our next speaker, Osman, and then um, if there are any questions for either Nadia or Osman, if you could just post them into the chat, we can um, try and um, have, a, have a few questions um, before they both have to leave us. Um, now, Osman um, is um, an individual who um, I've never met before today, but I was very pleased to, um, to, to, to see him this morning. Um, he participated um, in our survey when, um, when it was launched back in August, um, and he then, um, off the back of that, very kindly agreed to be interviewed as a case study. Um, and, and, and since then, um, he, he, he's felt able to, to, to come forward and to tell us um, uh, about his experience during the pandemic. So he, he works in the security industry. Um, I, I understand, Osman, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. This is, this is the information I've got, that he's yeah. a Dutch national who was born in Somalia, but has lived and worked in London for more than 10 years. So I hope that information's right. And um, he's worked for his current employer for um, between one and two years. That was the um, that was the bracket that was given in, in the survey questionnaire. Um, and I believe, um, off the back of what Nadia says, that that he is actually on a zero hours contract. Um, so um, Osman, um, we're all really interested and, and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And I think that you're going to talk about your experiences, but also those of your colleagues as well. So um, I'll hand over to you now. Yeah, man, thank you for having me, Daniel, and uh, nice people, Nadia, thank you for having us. And, um, and let me tell you my background. I'm a uh, trade union activist, member of Unison, and uh, over 10 years, I've been here for like about 15 years, to be honest. I've worked a couple of different jobs through the council. And um, I'm an international relations officer. I'm a uh, migrant campaigner, and also we're running an uh, Lobby Workers Union campaign to attract more migrants to join the union. It's like about join the union campaign. And um, as Nadia said, and uh, the migrant workers are frontline workers, to be honest with you. But and, uh, the issue we have is we're not classed as an essential workers. Therefore, what we cover, I mean, and uh, start from, I mean, I'm a security guard, I'm a lobby worker, but also when I'm a in my, I would like to, em to emphasize also when my other colleagues who are and uh, the care workers, the cleaners, the traffic wardens, and uh, the security guards, and um, the escort services, I mean, after the school programs, I mean, when you look at it, this kind of work has been uh, populated for migrant workers. And um, however, I feel like we've been cheated by the system especially when you look at, we all have one similarity, which is on a zero hours contract. That is where we fail to protect our frontline services, because when you see a key worker who got paid a minimum wages, that is really sad. Going back to my, my workplace as a security guard, I also have a contact with other security guards and uh, within my industrial area. The similarity that we have is actually there's no legal protection at all. COVID-19 did change a lot of things in the workplaces. In my opinion, the COVID-19 did not change anything at all in that kind of area. Because when you look at, and the security guards has been, has been privately run companies. So when the employer will not, focus on you as a security guard but also will, will, will protect his own asset when you look at it. And when company win a, an, a bidding, I mean, when you, as, as, as a company, you have to bid a, and, 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 um, a contractor to take over. All you can see every year, year in, year out, you see a different new company comes in. And all the employees are migrant workers. We failed. And um, I mean, the trade unions, when you look at it, failed the migrant workers, to be honest with you, because and then I am an, an union member and also work within a United member and also at other unions. And uh, going back to the hours contract, what we've got, there's no job security, undercut health and safety. And uh, COVID-19, I've got and a colleague of mine who has been isolated. I mean, my employer decided not to furlough employees at all, period. Even if you're sick, if you have a COVID or not, when you got sick, 
how it doesn't matter how long you've been working for them, you will end up on a job center, JSA. That's what happened. I mean, as we know, if you want to be furloughed, your employee will have to apply for you. But a lot of employer refused to do so. So we we are on the numbers, to be honest with you. A lot of a lot of my colleagues got sick. Some of them are still sick. But when you come back to work, you lost your permanent position. That's fact. So what you're gonna do? You're gonna end up having one day over there, one day over here, and not earning enough money for you. That's really, really sad. And um, when, when the employer send you location to work, my question that I always ask is, did the employer, did an inspection within the workplace? Was there any adequate PPE provided? Was there any hygiene and, 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 and equipment being provided? Sometimes we have an, a small box that one or two person work. One works in when when you look at the and then a small room which is like about a small pot cabined, I mean what about where is the destination what where, where are we not supposed to be having any space in between two meters three meters it doesn't exist there, so when um, where are the health and safety executives, was there there was I've I've never seen an inspection from our workplaces, so when um, I'm not only talking about only here about security guards, I've represented also as an as a union rep I also. I'm, I'm a union rep within my workplace. I represent the traffic wardens, the cleaners within my and in a local area. All you can hear is the similar. It's just what Nadia said now. That word just keep coming back again and again. Disadvantaged, you know, minimum wage for life. What I'm talking about is minimum wage for life. What I mean here is when you work, you work 12 hours a day, sometimes six days a week, there's no attendance allowances. There is no overtime pay. And uh, there is no weekend pay. And, um, and the job is still there. So it's like, if you want to work, you can come to work. But if you get sick, if something happens to you, you will take, you'll be taken off the rotor and you'll be penalized. You know what I mean? It's not only my area. I'm talking about all areas where the migrant workers are occupied. So we're in a stuck here, and uh, I'm, I have some to blame about the unions because I believe unions are not recruiting enough migrant workers. That's where the unions failed, and uh, to be honest, because and uh, let alone the migrant workers who are on the visas today. I mean, I cannot go down there because that's really a disaster, and uh, because they have no public fund available to them so when uh, they will have to do what they have to do with i, I was i was reading through and uh, about a few days ago and uh, the national and, um, and the nos statistics how many guards died i mean I, I remember in june 102 people died of my colleagues 102 security guards died only for one month more and more and more was dying have you heard about it no not only security guards, what about the guard, what about the traffic wardens? What about the cleaners who clean on, on, on the councils, in the hospitals? I mean, when you look at the security guards, we were now all over the places. We are outside hospitals. We are outside the, and, uh, the civic center where the councils are. We are, when, when the, and, uh, the jobs has been locked down, we were there to guard, to prevent the crime being, and, and the crime being taken over. And there was a lot of things happening. But I think, and um, in my opinion, we, we were not getting what we deserved in terms of pay, recognition, health and safety. And there's actually no legal protection. The legal and the employment law might, might, be, might be still there. Health and safety will st is, is gonna be there. Equality is st still gonna be there, but who's gonna enforce it? So when, uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's like you cannot say no. When you say no, you will have no work. That is one of, that's one of the main things that really, really gets us. Because then, uh, when you complain, who are you going to complain to? That is really sad thing. So when um, we really, we're not really doing so well. And, um, and when, you, when you look at it, since COVID started, in my local area, all you can see is the migrant workers in the buses. The bus driver is a migrant workers. We'll have to go to work. We attend work. 
but we're not getting enough. We're not getting enough attention. We're not getting enough and uh, funds. Also, we're stuck. And uh, so, therefore, and I'm gonna. That is one of the big, biggest problem we have. I mean, I wish we would have been classed as essential workers. We might be essential workers, but if you are essential worker, where do we end up on the minimum wages? Why minimum wages? For God's sake! I mean, if you work twelve hours a day, seven days a week. Six days a week, you only end up minimum wages. Where is time and half? Where is the overtime? We don't have that. So we're really, really struggling. I'm really glad that you guys came in today. And uh, am I gonna, and if you need more information, if you wanna, and uh, more migrant workers to come up and talk about what happened to their workplaces, we do run a campaign about migrant workers and also low bid workers and then the union. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Osman. That was um, that was really powerful. Actually, I think everyone um, is going to feel a lot more sober hearing directly from the horse's mouth exactly what the reality of your life has been like um, since since we entered this pandemic. Um, I've had a I've had a couple of questions through. So if I just start um, fielding them out to, to both you and Nadia, um, and then um, after a few minutes, I, I'll move on to, to our next speakers and you two can, can slip away. So I'll ask, I'll ask two questions and they're to both of you. Um, I suppose the first question would be um, to both of you. Um, what has the impact on your mental health been in terms of, um, being put in, in, in a situation where you feel like you're either having to put your health at risk or risk losing your employment or, or Nadia obviously off the back of um, what happened to you when you did speak up and um, how did that impact you directly um, and then secondly um, what would um, what would each of you like to change most about um, what what has happened to you during during the pandemic? If you could change one thing, um, what would that be? And uh, should I go first? And, uh, and, and uh, in terms of men and mental mental health, and uh, I'm a, I'm a father of four children. My youngest is and uh, six years old. And uh, to be honest with you, let me tell you something. This is the only time I earn a lot of money. <laughs> because no one else come to work, want to work. I worked six days a week since like March and April up until now. So, but the problem is, what the reason I did that was because I'm not sure whether will I have a work in next year because everyone else will come back to work. And also we've lost a lot of colleagues voluntarily and also involuntarily. We've got a lot of uh, workers that did not come to work because they felt unsafe not to work, number one. We've lost also a few people who died through COVID and as, as a security guard. And uh, in that consequences, some of us said, you know what, it's not worth for me to come to work. And they stopped working. I'll continue to work because I feel like this is the only time for me to earn because I don't know what might gonna happen. I'm sure there'll be job loss after January, February. I'm sure a lot of people will come, to, come back to work and demanding their work back. That is that, that's actually one thing that I that I did, and uh, one thing I would change in this is an uh, area not only as a as an and as a security guard as as a low bait area, is that I want government to involve, okay? that I want legislation to to come in. I mean the legislation are already there, but it's not it have nothing to do with us. To be honest with you, I want and uh, one contract being given out through any the council and give it to private company. What the councils fail to do is to do some follow-up. How the employers, how, how the employer treat the employees, what kind of work, working conditions we end up. Is there any justice in there? Do you know what I mean? And, and also I wish that the council, I mean, most of it has been privatized. It's the private companies who run it, but the government and the councils and the councils fail to follow up. That is something that I want to do with. The councils should go and follow up how the employer treat their staff. Thank you. Thanks, Osman. Nadia, have you got any thoughts? Echo everything that Osman said, and particularly would want to highlight the important work that security guards do because I think they're often overlooked. But when 
I speak to shop workers in my constituency who are kept safe and protected, particularly during the pandemic by security guards. Um, and it just shows how workers all rely on each other. Um, in terms of mental health impact, um, I mean, obviously it's not, it's not pleasant being a national news story and basically being told that you're a liar in the national news, that's not pleasant at all, but it's, it's nothing compared to what care workers who struggled to access PPE, struggled with low, low pay, no sick pay, um, had to contend with. And, and that's, that's the real problem. Although on a personal level, I am very relieved that extra care was able to issue a statement clarifying that I'd been truthful and that my efforts had helped secure PP supplies. Um, one policy or one change, it's very difficult just to narrow it down to one, isn't it? But two things that the government could do immediately is increase the minimum wage to a proper living wage of at least £10 an hour and increase statutory sick pay um, so that all wages are covered. Um, but beyond that, there needs to be long term work in the social care sector that increases workers' control and the control of service users, for want of a better word, and communities. And I think that should be written by the real experts in social care, and that's workers themselves. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and I just I, I can't thank you both enough. It's um it, it, it's incredibly um brave to to to, to speak out and um it's incredibly poignant and, and moving actually to, to hear from people um with direct experience who, who have been in, involved and, and lived through it. Um so um if Osman and Nadia slip off, then obviously that's fine now. But thank you so much. Um and I'm now going to um move forward um to um the rest of the speakers that we've got on the panel for this afternoon and each um, of the individuals you're about to hear from um, is from a um, partner organization that worked with the Migrants' Right Network um, in the preparation of this um, report. Um, so um, actually I don't think I've told them what order they're speaking in so it's going to be just as much as a surprise for them as it is for you. So Oji you're going first. Um, Oji is a, a project manager at Kanlungan Filipino Consortium and the co-chair of the Status now network which is a coalition of almost 100 organizations calling for the regularization of all undocumented migrants and those in the legal process living in the UK um, um, Oji's um, an exiled human rights activist and a writer from the Philippines and he is going to speak to the um, Filipino experience um, which is particularly pertinent as 32% of the respondents to our survey um, were Filipino um, and that's obviously directly as a result of um, Oji's con connection uh, at a grassroots level. Um, but I also think it's pertinent because um, I read recently that the Filipino Nurses Association, the UK branch, has actually reported that more Filipino nurses have died here in the UK than in the Philippines. I think the um, official figures that, 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 that have been released um, have stated that there are 40 NHS, 40 Filipino NHS workers um, who have died directly um, through COVID, but it's believed that unofficially that that, that figure um, is going to be um, estimated to be higher. Um, and I think, or, or I hope from our conversations, that um, Audrey's going to be focusing um, on the fear that many workers have um, of speaking out um, if things aren't right at their place of employment, um, and also the structure um, of many of the workplaces um, that, that, that we were talking about with our survey participants, um, which, which often led to um, inequality. Um, so I will um, hand over to, to Audrey now, and he'll be able to, um, to, to, to carry on talking about um, Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Actually, this is really a surprise. So um, uh, what are we going to talk about? So but for, ten, for, for this afternoon, so um, just to share with you, you know, when I was in the research uh, with Daniel and the group, um, I was really suspending a lot of things on my part. So because I just wanted to focus on, on the data that we should gather objectively, I have to suspend a lot of things because I am also a Filipino and 
and also I am a migrant and I, we, me and me and the rest of the Kandungan also with our experiences with uh, the, the deaths of, of, of Filipino migrant workers at the height of the pandemic, we would really like to get into the bottom of this. So, uh, but this is an opportunity for me to share some things, um, experiences as, um, uh, as, a, as, as a part of the research. So just like, for example, like a, a Filipino nurses, uh, actually comprise like 33.8 percent of the nursing workforce in the H NHS, and they, it represented like 22 percent of the deaths within NHS are actually Filipino migrant, uh, Filipino nurses. And uh, so um, we're really, really keen in Kadlungan to know exactly what happened, and 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 what are the factors that led to uh, uh, the deaths of so many migrant Filipino. Um, nurses in the NHS. No, so, well, I, I try to put some notes here so that I'm able to say something that I'm not supposed to say in public, but, you know, I have guys. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for attending this forum and the launch of the research of, of several migrant organizations uh, with MRN and also my organization, Filipino uh, Kalungan Filipino Consortium. I'm not going to give details about the results of the research, and I'd like to encourage everyone, I encourage you to thoroughly read the report come Monday and see if uh, for yourself. Um, but for this afternoon, I'd like to share salient points of, on my experiences in conducting this research, being part of, of, of the group, especially, especially from the data gathering. Um, I have a lot of things to say as a migrant myself with an irregular migration status in this country. I'm a political asylum seeker and a Filipino from the Philippines, from the archipelago. But uh, from, this blab, uh, from this blabbering or... Um, uh, um, I would like to, um, you know, I, uh, uh, for the purposes of clarity and precision, I'll structure my presentation this afternoon so when we get something edible from all this blabbering. And um, uh, something that can guide us, community workers, researchers, and policy ma makers, in unpacking this tragedy, and if I report it in a certain language, uh, on why more Filipino nurses died in this country, in the UK, a democracy than to be blunt about it, in the fascist Duterte regime in the Philippines, where the pandemic was and still being weaponized to silence the critics of his government and militarize the archipelago. So I will share my experiences in silent points um, um, in gathering data into three categories. One is in the cultural, the second is political, and the third is in social communal. Very, very fast. We're going to answer questions later. So let me begin with the, first, with the last one, the social um, communal. Um, I am a Filipino who speak the language and I share the same culture with the respondents. Ideally, it should have been easier for me to let the subjects speak or share their experiences or, or the basic of asking them to join the sur and answer the survey, no? but it was the other way around. Um, I observed Filipino migrant nurses prefer not to participate. It was really a very challenging uh, and daunting class. For fear of retribution from the home office or from the British institutions, their employer, and they're afraid to talk and they don't want to jeopardize their employment. Uh, you know, as I gather my uh, uh, information from my conversation with with the subject, with some of the participants, uh, they shared to me like they pawned their houses in the Philippines, properties, borrowed huge amount mon of money just to pay the visa, health surcharge, and other fees required by the Home Office just to work here. So as a Filipino, me, I had to deploy some cultural practices in, in the community, in our country, uh, just to engage and encourage the respondents to participate. Um, uh, we use, the, we use you know, uh, in, in the community, uh, we use a communal language that binds us together. Uh, we are more on, uh, on, 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 you know, relational than transactional. Um, um, we, 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 it's actually, we rely on, on network uh, community networks. Because at the end of the day, like for example, us in Kanlung, and we would like to know what happened, there, why there were more Filipino nurses uh, died in British institutions such as the um, NHS. And my conclusion in this category is this, that we should develop a new method and how we can involve the community in the research that we are doing. Like um, it should be first and foremost participatory, communal, and the knowledge that should be produced at least are in the endeavor should benefit first and foremost the migrant community. 
um, uh, also just to flag everyone, you know, in the concept of BAME, we as Filipino Southeast Asians, we are not actually part, you will look at it part of the BAME of the British people. No? So um, uh, there should be like something about this category uh, of, of categorizing migrants. Second is in the cultural. As I have observed, Filipino participants in the study were unable to read institutional racism in the UK. Like for example, why they can't, uh, they said that, you know, they, they were not allowed to file uh, a leave and so what happened to the others? They're on leave, something like that. And why something like uh, 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 all of them are Filipinos or person in color and uh, uh, the white uh, employers, where are they? Oh, they are actually on a higher post. So something like that. So it's like a glass ceiling. So uh, among others, in the Philippines, uh, we call this colonial mentality, like acting, constituting, propagating, embracing the colonial colonized Filipino, like meek, uh, uh, adherence to a hierarchy that the supervisor is the boss, do not bite the hands that feed you. Um, and, 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 and this is actually present in my conversations with some of the subject. Um, the problem with this is the racist institutions and its supporters read the Filipino colonial mentality. But the Filipino migrant worker, this is my, my reading, is failed to read the system as institutionally racist. So there is actually a disconnect, and unfortunately, the disconnect was very deadly. So my conclusion is we have to develop a method in how really to engage the community to speak, develop their own language to express themselves, a language that is free from the fear of retribution from British institutions. Now, the last one, the political, the sphere of retribution and this space where Filipino migrants are occupying uh, are, are spaces were designed, maintained, and sustained by what else? The hostile environment policy of the British uh, people hiring migrant Filipino workers. The amount of debts they incurred to pay for the home office visa requirements, the structure of the organization that details what spaces a migrant person of color should occupy beneath the glass ceiling and an environment that is very, very hostile to the migrants. So needless to say, the hostile environment poses a challenge, not just to migrants, but for community workers like us and for researchers. And um, uh, what I'm trying to uh, uh, encourage everyone is we have to look at this from the point of view that this is an opportunity for us, that there are a lot of things that we need to unpack on what is actually happening in our society. So um, I also, I'll stop here. So if you have questions, I'll try to answer it. Um, um, later. But thank you very much for the space, Adelia. Thank you so much, Aji. Um, yeah, and obviously, um, you know, your involvement in the project and your um, ability to, to engage with the Filipino community was um, really something that I was sort of you know, in awe of actually, because I, I think that at times we all struggled to, to, to try and earn the trust of the communities um, that, 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 that we were sort of seeking to, to, to represent and speak to. And you obviously have the ability to, to, to do that. So massive shout out to the team um, for that. Um, okay, um, next, next speaker um, is Ake, who's here representing uh, Migrants at Work. Um, Ake is a former um, child labourer and he worked as a trade union regional, regional organiser in the UK for a number of years. He is currently the Deputy General Secretary, Secretary of the National Trade Union of the Security Officers of the Côte d'Ivoire um, and he holds a BSc in International Relations and French and a Master's Degree in International Human Rights Law, which I think makes him probably more qualified than me. Um, he's training to become an employment and immigration lawyer at the minute and he set up Migrants at Work because he realised that many um, migrant and British workers from BAME backgrounds weren't getting the support that they needed in the labour market as workers because they are being organised as migrant or BAME workers as opposed to just being organised as workers. Workers. Um, and as a result, these groups um, are exploited by um, employers and excluded by unions, in particular those who are subject to immigration controls and um, the ones who are receiving no representation at work because of their immigration statuses. Um, now, Ake is 
supposed to be focusing on um, health and safety failures by employers and a lack of union support. But obviously, I appreciate that, that, that he's been involved in the project from the start. So it might be that um, he doesn't follow exactly what I've just said. Um, but yeah, without further ado, if I could um, welcome Ake um, to, um, to the podium. I'm not sure if he's still there, actually. It looks like his, his video is frozen. Ake, are you there? Ah, uh, alas, we've we've spent the past few months um, having to deal with Ake's um, lack of reliable technology. I think I can put it that way. I can see Oji and Katia um, laughing. Um, what I'll do then is after that um, after that very long introduction, I'll, I'll skip forward to um, our next two speakers, who are both um, from um, the Three Million um, project, um, and we've got um, Katia and um, Alexandra um, on. On the on the call now, so we'll go straight to you guys, and then when Ake comes back, yeah, in, yeah, we, yeah. we can make some time for him. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, are you are you back, Ake? Oh, I was just I was just telling all of our um, all of our webinar guests about your unreliable technology. You're insulting my technology. That's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just I've just finished giving them some background about you um, and okay. said that you were going to be talking about um, health and safety failures by um, employers and the role of um, trade unions as well. So okay, I'll, cool. I'll say no more. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, uh, Marion, for inviting us to, uh, to, to follow to, um, to this research. Um, when we were uh, conducting the, uh, the interview, and when we were writing the, the notes, what we have done is to look at for each industry, what are the minimum standard that employer has to comply with. And when you look at the way uh, these the participants were being treated, employer were not even complying with the basic minimum standard within the industry. So that's the first, that's the first thing. There are, the other issue is um, one other thing that came out was the immigration status. You will remember that there was a time where the government was rewarding migrants who were working in the NHS um, because they were working with you know, fabulous NHS. Therefore, they were granted uh, leave to remain in this country over migrants who were working in, sec in non public sector, those ones were not entitled to get a, a automatic leave to remain in the country, and they were not part of the government um, strategy. So this has created a lot of stress for many people who were forced to go to work simply because of the immigration status. So this has put them at risk. The role of the union is to support or workers including migrant workers and i've criticized union a lot simply because i want union to do better and during this crisis where was the trade union the trade union were shielding were in a house while migrant were in a front line so as osman was saying earlier the trade union has failed migrant, but it's not just today. The trade union have been failing migrant for a very, 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 very long time. And trade union need to change if they want to protect migrant workers. So the reason why you have a lot of migrant workers who've been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, it's, it's, it's nothing new. For me, this is a legacy of race discrimination. The reason why you see more migrant in the front line compared to non-migrant or compared to white people is simply for for us it's just a legacy of race discrimination that has put migrant in the front line and bme in the front line compared to to, to the white colleague there was one particular example that was given to me where the migrant worker went to to work he went to work with his own pp and when he got to work the uh it was an agency worker so when he got to work the uh the, the staff was behind a closed door and was telling him that he could not wear his PPE um, to work. 
and the re and they asked them why I couldn't do that. And they said to him, well, this is not a company policy. You cannot wear your PPE here. So he left. But in many situations, you have a lot of a migrant who's going to go to work because what COVID-19 has created was that it was a, a great opportunity for many migrant workers and BME who work in the agency. Most, most of them are um, self-employed. So this was a really great opportunity, as Osman said. It gave them more uh, overtime, more opportunity to do more work, to get more money. But by doing that, that were more exposed to COVID-19. It's not surprising that many are being affected. The role of the union is to support all workers, but the union hasn't done that at all. And the problem with the union is that racism exists within the trade union. And many union activists are uncomfortable with that when I say it, but trade union are racist. Even though trade unions are doing, are doing uh, protecting migrant workers and uh, workers in general, when it comes to tackle discrimination themselves, they are racist. So how can they go ahead and protect migrant workers? This has been really, really challenging for migrant workers to, to, to force their right at work. So there is a, a serious issue here where trade unions need to be able to acknowledge discrimination within the union before they can support migrant workers. And during this crisis, we haven't seen the union. So now we see a lot of union coming out and you know putting a lot of survey out there to find out how COVID-19 has impacted on BME and migrant workers. That's great. But where were you during the past two decades to racism so that you have you know a proportionate number of black people in the front line and white people all mixed, but it didn't work that way because you have more BME and migrant in the front line. So that was really one of the many issues during this COVID-19. So I'm going to stop there, Daniel. You're going to leave it there? Oh, okay. Oh, that, that's fine. No, 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 that's wonderful. That is wonderful because, um, we were a little bit concerned that Ake was going to run over. So he's obviously been practicing to keep his points very concise. But that is absolutely perfect, Ake, um, because I'm told that we're going to lose the link at 4.30. So um, thank you for that. And um, I think that that's certainly something um, that will give a lot of people, um, such as me, like I say, who, who isn't from a trade union background, a, a, a lot of food for thought. Um, actually, obviously, something that that a lot of us should feel quite angry about, I think. Um, okay, well, moving to um, our last two speakers who I will introduce together. Um, as I was um, saying, when we thought we'd lost Ake, um, Alexandra um, and Katia are here today representing um, the three million. Um, Alexandra is um, a migration research and an EU migrants' rights campaigner. She's got a PhD in migration studies from University College London and has worked in a variety of academic and non-academic projects on migrants' rights, particularly with, with Romanian migrants. Currently, Alexandra um, co-chairs the, the Young Europeans Network at the Three Million, a group of young migrants campaigning on access to citizenship, political rights and other issues relevant to EU citizens in the UK. Um, and she also works as an OISC Level 1 Immigration Advisor for UK Butterflies and coordinates a project in collaboration with Polish migrants organised for change focusing on outreach in Polish, Romanian and Roma communities in London. Um, and I know this because I follow her on Twitter, but she regularly comments on immigration policy in the British and international media, and she's very active on Twitter. So if anyone is looking to follow her, her Twitter handle is at Alexandra Bulat, which is B-U-L-A-T, that's all one word. Um, and um, she um, and Katia um, are, are going to speak, as I say, on behalf of Three Million. So Katia um, is the chair of directors at the Three Million. She's an organiser and migrants' rights campaigner, and she worked for 15 years for Unison. Um, so she can obviously speak to um, some of what Ake was saying about the trade unions. Um, she organised migrant workers principally in outsourced services in health and social care and supported them understanding their rights at work. 
and better um and, and better working conditions and she also campaigned for better immigration policies so um both um both katia um, and alexandra are, are, are gonna speak to us i think about the impact that that, that brexit um, has been having on the european community in the context of covid as well um, but um, I'll, I'll let them um, I'll let them speak and, and, and introduce the topics that, that they're going to speak to us about before we um, have some questions. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that introduction. I will start first with some more general remarks about the impact we have seen at the 3 million, the impact of COVID on EU migrants in the UK. And Katia was actually the person who did a couple of, of case studies for uh, for this research. So I think she can speak more about the her reflections on the actual research. And I can speak more from the 3 million perspective, identifying a few of the issues that are really relevant and still haven't been solved in the current COVID uh, context. Um, now, uh, whenever someone asks me about, well, speak a bit about the problems, what is still left to solve on EU migrant rights, what are the issues of the EU settlement scheme or with COVID, I always think like, where, where, where do I even start to speak about the problems? Because there are so many problems and it's impossible to fit everything in like, you know, five or 10 minutes. I think we need like a two hour lecture going through all the problems that any, any kind of group of migrants experiences in the current uh, COVID um, context. What I would say, first of all, before I identify a couple of those issues we would like to reflect on a bit more perhaps in the conversation is um, is that uh, I as Daniel said, I co-chair I, I co the Young Europeans Network and most of our volunteers are obviously young Europeans, but they also come from primarily Eastern European backgrounds. And if we look at uh, the different flows of migration from Europe, uh, people in lower paid work, lower paid jobs, including social care and some of the sectors we spoke about today tend to be younger people, mainly of Eastern European background. Uh, so a lot of the exploitation that's been happening in work in the UK is primarily targeting, you know, Romanians, Polish citizens uh, and less so I mean I don't say it doesn't exist but less so people from from Western Europe so there's like some inequalities within the EU migrant population as a whole because when we speak about EU citizens and EU migration perhaps some of us have this assumption that everyone is you know just taking advantage of freedom of movement and being really nice and equal to British people but actually there are a lot of inequalities within the group itself depending on different perceptions and and discrimination towards certain nationalities more more than others um, so we identified a lot of different issues at the 3 million over the course of the, the pandemic since very early on we predicted some of the problems that people of EU migrant background would experience. Um, and the first issue that I will mention, I'll mention this one because we actually have a tool uh, for migrants to use that I can put, post on the chat after, is the issue around continuity of residence. So of course, a lot of people, uh, even people who are in work in those sectors, uh, okay, mi migrated back to different countries because of the pandemic, and a lot of them haven't returned so far for various uh, uh, travel restrictions, health related reasons, the shielding and other reasons. Um, and this will have a massive impact on their status because for EU migrants, EU migrants have to apply for either pre-settled or settled status, settled if they've been in the country for over five years uh, to be uh, to continue to live lawfully in the UK after the 30th of June, 2021. But those with pre-settled status is basically a limited leave to remain. So first of all, you lose pre-settled status if you're out of the country for more than two years and then you also you also can't uh, apply for a settled status so you can't build up your continuous residence if you're out of the country more than six months in any 12 months period so for all of the people that i communicate with and that we support uh, actually there are some people who have been absent already six months or over and they're really concerned about not being ever able to build this continuity of residence and having a full settled status and actually full rights to welfare for example because with pre-settled status you don't have the same rights it's a more precarious status than settled status. The other issue that we see quite a lot, and I speak just from my experience, just uh, doing different inboxes in the 3 million where we get contacted by a lot of European citizens, is the issue around that has been going on from March until last week, uh, which was about national insurance numbers. So the appointments were cancelled. Only last week they opened the phone line so you can get uh, a form sent to you. Uh, but it's only for people who have pre-settled or set settled status in terms of EU citizens. Uh, so there are still a lot of people who were unable, who migrated to the UK 
okay, recently often working low paid jobs who are unable to um, get a national insurance number still. And this means that they fall into an even more precarious situation in the time of COVID uh, because they won't be, uh, their employer like uh, will be more likely to discriminate against them because they don't have those uh, other protections. And then final, a final issue I will mention is also around, I'm not sure if you have seen in the news recently, some councils in the UK object to the Home Office uh, um, rules that enable uh, to remove uh, EU citizens and migrants in general who are who are homeless uh, in this period and obviously COVID meant that a lot of migrants on low paid and insecure contracts have lost their jobs and homelessness has risen in some parts of the country um, and this is very concerning because we have uh, after the 31st of, uh, of December 2020 EU migrants uh, who don't have a status although they have still time to apply for settled status and pre-settled status until 30th of June 2021, uh, although they can still have time, the immigration rules have changed and those changes means that people who don't have a status in this grace period will actually uh, have to uh, be in a more precarious situation, especially if there's someone who is homeless, for example, so we're really concerned about that, uh, uh, that issue. Um, so I'm sure Katya will touch a bit more on the workers' rights aspect of it and on, on mental on mental health. So what I want to, to do is just to uh, share a couple of useful tools for migrants on how to calculate their absences and how to secure their uh, pre-settled and settled status on, on, on the chat if you find it useful for the people that you work with. Uh, and then Katya can speak more about uh, about the project. I'll make one final comment, and I think this in response to, to uh, Rogelia earlier about the recruitment process. I work a lot with Romanian migrants in terms of my research, and um, I was also reflecting on this term of, uh, of BAME and how this relates to some, especially to Eastern Europeans, because I remember when I came to the UK and I completed the form and someone says, said to me, you're actually an ethnic minority in the UK. And I was like, really? Like I didn't I didn't know, you know, such term even even existed in the UK from where I come from in, in Romania. So I think that's a, actually an interesting research point of how do we gain trust with especially with Eastern European communities and what kind of terms or like categories they actually identify with. Do Romanians identify more as Romanians or perhaps as Eastern Europeans or perhaps as ethnic minorities or how do we actually um, yeah, because when we target a survey for like BME or BAME and migrant workers, would Romanians or Polish people or, you know, other nationalities actually respond to, to, to that? So I will let Katia detail more on the actual process of the research. I just want to set some broad issues. But as always, there are so many problems right now that we're campaigning on from the lack of physical documents that we're leading on as, as a campaign organization to, you know, many other like more specific young European issues in my case and, and not only. So, yeah, Katia, over to you. Thanks, Alexandra, and thanks, Daniel, for the introduction. I'm going to try to be really short because I'm conscious that, you know, there's going to be not many time for questions. So I'm just going, really going to speak for two, three minutes and uh, try to cover uh, union work a little bit. And probably digital status, which will be probably for workers, not only workers, but uh, public service providers and as well employers uh, in the long run. From next year, um, so um, I'm have you know I had experience working with migrants in general uh, in my work as an organizer for Unison, and for the last the past four years uh, with EU migrant workers specifically. Uh, I, so I have experience of in public services, but I can tell you that what has been uh, you know since. Uh, June 2016, it's been uh, an unsettling journey, and that for many brings impact on this and fear that things will become harder on a day to day basis when the UK leaves the EU bloc next year. Um, and I know many, many people that have suffered mental health breakdown. Uh, as Alexandra explained, uh, EU nationals, there's a lot of uh, discrepancies and, and different, uh, you know, depending on nationalities in the EU group, but um, mainly a lot of people, thanks to freedom of movement, have been able to get rights, access to rights and workers' rights, even though like many people don't know their rights at work, things um, have been pretty okay but this is going to considerably change next year even though it has already changed 
Uh, as an example, uh, we have received many, many testimonies of workers who have lost their job during the pandemic. And by the lack of knowledge that they need to apply for the uh, EU set of status uh, the, to prove their eligibility to welfare support, many had delay in getting that support and some were unable to prove their eligibility, which means that some have lost pretty much everything and ended up uh, homeless. Um, for the last five years, uh, you know, I worked specifically uh, with outsource cleaners in large NHS trust uh, covering, you know, those regions, the south of the Midlands, southern regions. And most of those workers are from migrant uh, backgrounds and from experience, a lot of them are uh, in the 50s. And as you can imagine, uh, keep exposure to the virus, uh, to the virus in the workplace is by uh, having clean surfaces. So the demand for housekeeping services have massively increased. Um, some workers uh, have felt the pressure from the employers to do more um, with less and sometimes without an adequate PPE equipment. So one of the campaigns we had forward during the pandemic within Unison, and that wasn't until I worked back in the summer, was to um, was around getting more health and safety workplace representative to make sure that risk assessment could be conducted and to protect workers and service users, uh, and to respond to Ake. Um, you know, unions, especially large unions, are big institutions and things can be slow and there's a lot of frustration, I understand, around organising uh, black workers and black workers, uh, but um, there's still people trying really hard to organise migrants' communities and black workers to, to equal access to rights and to make sure that they have the support needed. It needs to come heavy from uh, from the ground and pressure, like um, you know, the top of the union to to put this into place. Uh, so I agree with uh, with AK in that measure. Um, last point: it's about next year. It's going to be a difficult year because, uh, as you know, the EU settlement scheme is a digital status and. Um, it's gonna really, really impact uh, how EU workers will have to prove the right to work uh, using that status. A lot of them don't know how to use it. And it looks like everyone is unprepared from employers, service providers, and those holders of those status. The sub realities like digital status, immigration status is going to affect all future migrants entering the UK, so it's not a uh, 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 migrant issue only. So that's me. Thank you. Sorry, Katia, I think we were having, a, I think there was a slight delay on that. Um, but um, thank you both. Um, thank you both so much. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. So um, if there is anyone that um, would either like to speak their question, then just if you post your name in the chat, I can come to you and you can unmute yourself. Um, or um, I'll, I'll go through um, and, and look at what's been posted. Um, just before I, I go to those questions, I suppose one thing I, I would like to come back to um, is actually this, this discussion about the use of the word BAME, um, because certainly, um, when I was thinking about what to call this project and how to promote it, I was also a little bit reluctant to use um, to use the term BAME. I, I know it's I know it's frequently used, but um, we actually um, ended up settling on people of colour, um, migrant workers, and, and people of colour, which. Um, was um, some something that that, that that I thought quite carefully about because I know certainly um, as someone from from the black community that that, that there is an issue with um, people being grouped together under BAME but I still think that people of colour is problematic as well because I I, I think it it it, it does um, it, it does something similar so um, certainly for, for anyone on the call um, who shares those concerns and um, as Alexandra and, and, and Audrey were, were were talking about I think that would be something really interesting to look at in the future um, 
I'll answer a question um, that, I, that I hope I can answer um, from Kim that was posted um, right at the start of the talk. Um, and she was asking um, whether or not we had, as part of our research, um, the figures for non-migrant um, workers um, to, to, to sort of compare them to, um, in relation to, to our findings about concerns about uh, attending work and impact on mental health, etc. cetera. Um, we don't actually, the, 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 the survey that we designed was exclusively for um, people of color and migrant workers. Um, so we don't have that data set and that would definitely be something that would be really interesting to look at. Um, we are able to look at within um, the survey respondents, the different responses that we've got from people who are people of colour, but British citizens, for example, as compared with um, people who don't have settled status, who, who are, I, I think we had a handful of, of, of migrants and asylum seekers. And so we are able to, to compare that, um, but it's not, um, it's not something that, that that, that we were able to look at as part of this project more widely. But that's definitely something, I think I said at another event that I spoke at, that I'd be really interested to, to, to look at that and perhaps that could be the next project that, that we go on to look at and compare the experiences um, of, of white frontline workers with, um, with those who, who are not white to see if there is a huge disparity. Um, yes, Kim, I agree, it is important to compare the different, the different experiences and, and you're right. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else that, that has a, um, a question for any of our um, any of our panel members. Obviously, we've lost Nadia and Osman, but um, um, Raf, I can see that you've um, posted something in the chat. It's just the most recent one that's come up, and it's for Oji. So, um, um, Raf, if you want to unmute yourself and ask it yourself, please feel free. If not, I can just read it. Okay, I'll read it. Um, so, Oji, could you elaborate on the idea of post-colonial subjectivity on communities like, like the Filipino community? Did you say that Filipino health workers um, are oblivious of the institutional racism in institutions like the NHS? Um, this is actually one of the things that we are exploring and looking into um, uh, because I've, I've said, no, in Kandungan, we are actually very... Um, uh, we are really keen to know uh, exactly the bot the, what what really happened, the bottom of all this. And based on our conversations with the community, and of course with this research also, and and um, because there is there is a part of the research that I need to speak to um, um, several several respondents. Um, um, one is um, you know in, in in the Philippines, I have said we have we call this. Uh, it's in in the parlance in our language in the Philippines we call this colonial mentality. You know that if you are, um, we, we we still read, for example, um, the concept of um, um, the concept of of hierarchy of you do not feed the hands, uh, uh, do not feed the hands that you know, do not bite the hands that feed you, and of course that 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 we are like something that oh this is a um, a, a white space. Um, this is a, uh, uh, you know, it's something that that, that has an has, has a resonance to our experience as a former colonized um, uh, uh, country or a community. So one of the things that we are actually that we are really exploring and looking into is the behavior um, of, of of the behavior and the perspective of of a Filipino migrant workers inside the. Um, uh, the NHS, and when I say I think I have I agree on a certain degree. This is on me and my personal uh, uh, take and reading. I agree that uh, I think a Filipino health workers are really like oblivious on a certain degree um, on of the institutional racism of 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 NHS. But in in my I mean to put it like in my own observation, it's not really that oblivious. But I think something to do with the reading. I think the failure to read um, uh, uh, the, the 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 institutional racism as it uh, uh, present in 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 NHS or in, in the workplace, um, um, and I think this is a lot a lot of things to unpack. Like for example, just so you know that we have a labor export policy in the Philippines, so we ex we export people as a worker, and this kind of of economic structure in the Philippines is a product of our colonial past. 
uh, of a of an economic system that is actually part of a colonial past. So uh, there are very very a lot of things to unpack actually um, uh, with with this uh, what happened specifically on the part of of the colonial experience of Filipino migrant workers working here in a country that we actually don't have a colonial ties or relations in the past. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Audrey, for for answering that. Um, Ake, I'm gonna um, put this question your way. I think it was a question for um, Osman, but obviously he's not here um, anymore. Um, but this is a question um, from Musharat, and and he's um, he, he's asked if there was no support at all, and why were the trade unions unhelpful? So I wonder if perhaps as you were speaking about sort of the involvement of the trade unions you might be able to to, to, to give us um, a bit of an insight into why the trade unions were not doing enough or why they didn't do enough you're on mute okay every time i think one of one of the many issues with the trade union is those trade union if you look at the composition of a trade union official and trade union representative they do not understand the issue of uh, discrimination work. And actually there is a report from the PUC that confirmed what I'm saying about racism within the trade union. And this report is a racism ruins life, a report commission, a research commission by the TUC. So because trade union do not understand racism, how to deal with racism, so there is a difference about, you know, knowing racism in the law, and seeing racism and dealing with racism. And when you have a bunch of people who are mainly white trying to support people, black people or migrant who are going through discrimination, it can't work because they don't understand what the issue is. As a result of that, they cannot help migrant who are facing this kind of an issue because they are dismissive of discrimination against black people and migrant workers at work. And again, these are not my words. We need to look at this report, Racism Ruins Life, which talk about racism within the trade union. But of course, all the trade union officials are not racist, but it, it's the institutional racism within the trade union that create its problem. That's the reason why trade unions are unhelpful, because the issue many migrants have been going through and Black people have been going through with COVID-19, it's about discrimination. But if trade unions you know, do not understand where black people are coming from, they're not going to be helpful. They're not going to be able to help them deal with the issue and challenge employers. Thank you, Ake. Um, sorry, I was just a little bit distracted because I was being told that um, our, our, our link's going to end in three minutes. So um, what I'll do now is I'll just um, formally close the session um, by um, just thanking everyone so much um, for, for, for coming and listening. And thank you to all our speakers and a personal thanks from me to all our um, all the all the project partners that have worked with Migrants Right Network on this um, research project. Um, if everyone could just keep an eye out for their emails on Monday, we'll be publishing the report. And of course, if you've got any um, any questions or concerns, then and please feel free to get in contact. Our contact details um, for, for, for each of us will be detailed in the report. Um, so um, hopefully something good can come from, um, you know, off the back of this. Um, and there's definitely still more work to be done. There's definitely still more research to be undertaken. Um, but certainly for me, it's been a, a huge privilege and um, an incredibly important project to be a part of. So um, thanks again to the Paul Hamlin Foundation and thanks to um, Migrants Right Network for, for, for getting me involved in the project. And thanks to um, Ken Lungan, the three million um, and migrants at work for being um, so great to work with over the past few months. Um, thank you everyone else for attending. Have a lovely, um, I would say afternoon, but it's basically pitch black outside now. So have a, have a lovely evening, everyone. Um, stay safe, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.